Hey folks, Prof Joel Pearson here for Future Minds. I'm a professor of psychology and neuroscience at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. Today we're talking about aphantasia, mental imagery, how to measure it, how to diagnose it, even though I don't like using the word diagnose because it suggests something negative, something bad about aphantasia. But I just wanted to throw that in there to give a little bit of sense of where we're going with this. All right, so historically, where do we start with this? We start with uh, questionnaires, the classic way to measure and assess mental imagery. And they're great. The vividness of visual imagery questionnaire is by far the most well-known, the most used questionnaire. And if you Google that, you'll find a bunch of different examples of that. And you can test yourself on that. Now, when it comes to neuroscience, the problem with questionnaires is they are subjective. And what we found is that we can't always rely just on questionnaires. Why? Here's an example. So someone who doesn't really know what imagery is or imagery isn't, and has aphantasia, maybe through their whole life they've thought the idea of imagery is a metaphor. They've not really realized that imagery is something we can consciously experience, which it is. If you have mental imagery, you can picture something in your mind's eye and you have a conscious experience with it. So let's say you have aphantasia, you've always thought imagery, the idea of imagery was a metaphor, then you're gonna give a high rating on a questionnaire, even though you don't have any imagery. So we've seen examples like that where someone will fill out a questionnaire, we educate them and tell them what imagery can be in some people, and they're shocked by that, and they go, whoa, 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 okay, well, I filled that out wrong, I need to down-regulate all my scores on that questionnaire. So there's things like that. It has a problem of what's called, what we call metacognition, which is just the idea of uh, how much you are aware of your own thinking, your own uh, cognition. So questionnaires are great, they're scalable, you can send them out all over the world uh, online, but yes, they are subjective, they are assessing imagery, they're also assessing what I said, metacognition. So to put that in another way, what I might call a four out of five, you might call a one out of five, right? Even though our imagery might be exactly the same. So you're measuring two things, you're measuring what the imagery might actually be, and we're also measuring the number someone decides to give it. So there's two things going on there, which can be a little bit tricky. Now, the other technique we developed way back in 2008 is something called binocular ivory. So we've published a bunch of papers on that. So are the other, other labs now. And that is a visual illusion. And I won't go into details about how that works, but you basically present two different things, uh, one to each eye. And it turns out that this, this pretty cool visual illusion is a way to measure the sensory strength of imagery. And this is how it works. So in binocular rival, we have a green pattern and a red pattern. And what you need to do is imagine one of the patterns, then we flash on this binocular rivalry really quickly. And if you have imagery, what you imagine changes the way you see that visual illusion. So if I imagine red, I'm more likely to see red if I have imagery. Right, so it's a step forward, it's less subjective, there's less metacognition there. You can argue that, hey, there's a bit of metacognition, there's a bit of subjectivity in this binocular rivalry illusion, and there's also ways to get around that. You can put in little probes and little things into the binocular rivalry thing, so you don't have to give your opinion of which one of those red or green patterns was dominant. So there are ways to get around that, there are ways to, for it to be quite objective and reliable. So that's the second technique, binocular rivalry. Now the third we've pioneered in the lab here is pupil response, right? So you know if you're a pupil, if we look at something bright, you look up at the sun, but yet yeah, don't go around doing that at home, um, but your, any bright light will cause your pupil to contract, right? So it's protecting your eye, it's letting less light in. Turns out that if you imagine bright things, your pupil also constricts. So right from the imagined experience of light, again, if you have imagery, your pupil will also constrict. And it turns out this is a nice way to objectively measure mental imagery strength. The stronger your imagery, and indeed the more vivid your imagery, the more constriction you get of that pupil when you imagine bright things compared to when you imagine dark things. So that's, what are we up to? The third way of measuring it. You can measure imagery in other ways. You can measure the emotional response, if you like, to imagining scary things. 
So you'd have people read scary stories, swimming in the ocean and the shark swims by, that kind of thing. And they will get slightly aroused, they get slightly scared by that. And we can measure that with skin conductance. So you sweat slightly more, right? You're not dripping like you're doing a workout. Um, put a little probe on someone's finger and we measure how much their sweat changes. The stronger their imagery, the stronger their emotional response from the emotional imagery. And that's another way to measure again, but emotions come in there. So it's not as clean as probably the binocular ivory or the pupil response. So there's the main ways to measure it. Of course, we can put you in a brain scanner. You can have your brain scanned uh, with functional magnetic resonance imaging while you're trying to imagine something, while you're attempting imagery. So we can do that as well, of course, as a diagnostic tool, that's much more time uh, expensive and, and it just costs a lot more. Scanners typically cost, you know, hundreds or thousands of dollars per hour. So while we use those methods for actual research, they're not great to, to test your imagery at home. EEG, electroencephalography, will be another method we can use to try and uh, assess your imagery. But again, requires a whole lot of wires going to your head. Um, cumbersome, slow, need a lot of tech. I really think the questionnaires, binocular ivory, and pupil response are the ways, most interesting ways, and potentially most scalable and objective. We're working on ways to do the pupil response on a mobile device on your phone. So if that works out, I think it might work out, then anyone could measure their imagery strength at home using their phone in an objective and reliable manner. So that's a really brief uh, intro into how you can assess aphantasia. If you wanna do that at home, if you're a medical practitioner, you're a neurologist, um, they're the different options we have available. Um, but also you can just try imagining something, right? You can try and think about what an apple looks like and do you have a conscious experience of that apple? So to be clear, so we're on the same page, if you have imagery and you think about what an apple looks like, you will experience something. You'll experience it's fleeting, it, but it is conscious. You'll see kind of an apple in your mind's eye. So some people with imagery will have that experience. People with very strong imagery, hyperphantasia, will have a very strong and vivid and clear uh, experience of the apple. So that's it, a mini intro course 101 into measuring aphantasia, measuring mental imagery. Hope it was useful. If you like this content, subscribe, hit the like button. It helps with the algorithms, of course. Uh, and I'll see you next time.